let's start the grilling. It, it's a grilling, right? Okay. <laughs> That's not what I told them. But, uh. So I'd like to start out with really the fundamental question. And I'm just going to toss this out. This is like uh, whoever goes first. And if nobody goes, you'll certainly get called on. Um, you know, when we talk about business models, what are they? Business models are basically you know, who pays whom for what. That's really what a business model is all about. So our panel's theme, reinventing the business model. Let me just ask the panel for examples and highlights of what's the biggest change in what your readers and your clients or advertisers are paying you for or bartering with you for that you see this year and try to spin ahead a couple of years. So this year, and where do you think it's headed? So anybody want to take that? Changes in who's paying you for what? Advertisers and their audience. And how's it changing? I'm happy to have a go at that. Um, our business model is about a third subs, a third advertising, and a third event. So we're pretty well balanced. Um, and the three kind of big changes that uh, we've seen, certainly in the last 12, 18 months, um, is, is and, and none of this is going to be a massive surprise to people, but the uh, number of um, our subscribers who are engaged really highly with our digital products. Um, so uh, virtually all of our brands, we're 18 brands, it's doubled. Uh, in some cases, it's trebled. Um, and in some of our brands, the value placed now on the digital properties over the print properties um, has surpassed that. But in lots of cases, that hasn't happened yet. So we've still got a number of brands where the print is more valued than the, the digital products. So the digital engagement and the digital usage has been a, a really big change, and that's all paid for uh, via, via the subscription. Um, secondly, the kind of followers uh, that we have on Twitter. I mean, this is a proper explosion. So I have you know, roughly 100,000 paid for subscribers, but I've got uh, uh, nearly 300,000 followers on Twitter across my different brands. And um, we, we, we love this because this is an extraordinarily strong tool for giving our customers early breaking news, um, giving them a chance to have a conversation uh, directly with our journalists. Um, and it's just an incredible tool for engagement. Um, and as a result of the, kind of those two factors, we've seen our renewal rates in our subscriptions grow by 15% in that same period. Um, so whilst I'm not making direct money from Twitter, it is driving this engagement and driving the happiness of, of my subscribers. Um, and then the other really big shift is um, as what's being talked about quite a lot today, which is the um, solutions that are, um, I suppose an old word would be advertisers, but let's call them clients, um, the solutions that they want to buy. Um, and clearly, in 10 years ago, we know that that was sort of display advertising and maybe a few other bits and pieces. And now it's very much um, supporting them in helping them create a relationship with our audience, um, supporting their brand, um, helping them get their content and their messages out to our audience, um, and helping them bring them together as well, face to face. Uh, so our events business is, is uh, doing incredibly well. Let me ask you one quick follow up before I ask someone else on the panel. Do your clients come to you with you know, uh, performance objectives around followers uh, on the Twitter point? Is that now part of the package? Get us 100,000, get us 10,000. You tracked and rated on that, and again, tied to the discussion of how, over time, how will people value a follower? What's it worth? Now, you referred to renewals, but did they, are the clients asking you for measured? They're not asking for it specifically. They okay. are certainly saying, can you help us? I don't think that the, um, the, the exact questions are being, being asked, so I think part of our job is, is an agency coaching job to help support um, our clients you know, meet their objectives and sometimes flush out those objectives. Great. Anybody else on the business model? Tim, your hand yeah. up. Yeah. Um, I think you know, if you look back to the basics, we've seen a, a dramatic change in the way in which co content is consumed in the last 12 to 18 months. Um, and clearly, there's been this fantastic growth in um, the way in which people are now consuming content on the move. Um, you know, 10 years ago, I wouldn't ever have dreamt that we would be able to communicate in real time with the cons customers in the verticals that we serve. But we can communicate with them in real time. And you know, we have a, a simple strategy of, of 
enabling technology to sort of get all our content into the right, uh, it, in, into the inbox or at the right platform in the way in which our customers then consume it. So uh, the fact that people are, are now consuming content, you know, either through a tablet um, or um, a, a smartphone or on the desktop has then enabled us to move our core proposition, our core subscription proposition from a one-to-one -one subscription uh, proposition where we have an, you know, a relationship with an individual reader to a corporate uh, relationship. So where you had old-fashioned pass-on readership <laughs> with, a, with a stapled um, paper proper property, you knew you had maybe six or seven readers per subscriber. What we've done is we've really focused very aggressively globally um, particularly with our private equity uh, insurance and risk management assets in building out that site license model, which in turn creates many more eyeballs that we can monetize through e-learning uh, property, through lead gen uh, business and those sorts of things. I also think, you know, just going back to the fundamentals, uh, the sort of fun fundamentals of, of a client relationship, uh, you know, gone are the days where clients just book ad, ad pages in these markets. You know, or you know, or uh, frankly, just add a, a book campaigns online. You know, we're we're really seeing a very significant move in our business and across some of the markets we serve to more holistic packages, where we might include advertising as part of it, but we're looking at more results-oriented uh, type uh, deals with clients. Well, we're having to put our balls on the line. You know, we're taking a risk, and I sort of mentioned earlier before we met that actually historically our salespeople have always, um, I say historically, they over-promised and under-delivered because they felt that we would, you know, the, the best way now is to under-deliver and over-perform. Uh, but that's, there has been a big change there. And on the enterprise, on the new enterprise focus, on your paid products, sort of changes to pricing. Are you doing enterprise pricing on, on, on paid subscriptions or not? Um, I wish it was really scientific. I mean, we, it's, I mean, we use the analogy of a staircase. You're moving up a staircase because we've got, um, I love I take the risk management piece as an example. We've got a global, um, we've only got five and a half thousand subscribers on risk, but they pay 125 pounds a copy. <laughs> um, so it's a very high value academic property. Um, but on an enterprise basis, we're moving corporates who may have paid 10 to 15,000 pounds for five or six copies of risk to, uh, we got one deal out at 220,000, which is a global enterprise solution. We've just signed the US Fed this morning at $55,000. So these are businesses that were sea changing the quantum of money we get per site. And you know, we're, we're looking at year one, a five times uplift in the amount of money we got from individual subscribers. Now, of course, we've had to invest very substantially in the back-end authentic authentication. We've had to make sure we've got the right technology at the back-end to be able to authenticate who these people are and then ensure that we deliver real-time content through, um, you know, through these various these properties. But it is very substantial, and it climbs, it builds. I mean, we've already, and we're, we're, we're in March, and we started this part of our business literally 14 months ago. Uh, we had to put the CMS in place to start with. But already in March, we're two times the forward revenue than we were for the whole of last year because of the step up you see in that part of the business. It's sizable. Powerful. Yeah. Bob, you had something. Yeah, so I think it um, has to do with how you define uh, your end user audience. I mean, we think in terms of subscriptions and moving users to digital, and certainly we're seeing that. But the big shift, I would say, that really picked up speed in the last year is um, thinking about the categories we serve and how do we pursue the total audience within it. You know, so pushing not just beyond B2B, but beyond the core subscription base. And there are many business models that lay underneath that. For instance, um, audience-based buying, leveraging our data to be able to you know, target like audiences. Um, video syndication. You know, we were always trying to figure out how do you syndicate video? How do you get critical mass around that among a tightly defined audience? Well, by partnering with 450 sites around the world that IDG doesn't own through our third-party ad network, we're able to aggressively syndicate and generate you know, a lot of incremental revenue through, through video. So I think that the expanded view of the end user audience we serve has then led to new uh, business models that touch marketing services um, and, and enable us to, uh, you know, to expand in, into areas that you know, previously 
we were just limited to our core circulation base. Now we're thinking much more expansively. You know, I meant to ask all of you, and I'll cycle back, Bob, on you. Maybe the others can speak up if you choose. Impact, this is new revenue. Revenue's half the equation, margins the bottom line. Impact on margins, are there issues here? And one of the claims is that marketing services is essential, drives engagements, drives loyalty, but is inherently a lower margin business. That may not be the, the case, but well, how, does, how does this affect margins? Not just marketing services, but these, the, your, your ad network, your, uh, your, your video syndication. I mean, what we've seen in so many media markets is that you know, there's reward to scale, right? And, and scale does matter, I think. I think it's harder and harder for smaller companies to compete. There are so many channels now that we have to deal with end users, you know, through, you know, video, as I mentioned, is a new one. You know, obviously, social media has been just, just a huge new channel. Um, you know, digital in general, mobile, we, we could go on and on. L layering programs on top of that requires very focused resources, you know, so having dedicated marketing services businesses that lay on top of that. Right. And in terms of margin, you know, uh, you know, it's very difficult. I find, you know, we're in 90 countries. Uh, it's, it's hard in a lot of the smaller countries, for instance, to be able to do some of these things. Um, you know, so I think that y your question depends on, on the scale. And I think that uh, certainly... Uh, good technology isn't cheap. Yeah. And I think, again, you, you've got to invest in certain parts of the business, maybe incubate test, model, and then, then take across the business. Um, and again, it, I absolutely agree with Bob. I mean, it, if you have the fortune to be a larger business and you have the scale either locally or globally, that, that helps with margin development. But it, it is, it's never been cheap. And I think that, you know, from our perspective in terms of the changes we've seen is, it, is really that kind of focus, you know, all the trends you've identified, I think we're seeing as well. But I think if you like the workflow side of things, is becoming a very important focus. And that actually is all about technology, you know, because it's about really understanding how do you get into um, that, you know, that person's, you know, working day as opposed to just bringing them information. And I think that's, that's the big challenge. And that's, and that's hard and that does take investment and focus and potentially also getting involved in businesses that are very culturally different from us. And a few fuck ups. Yeah, completely. You've got to accept that's going to happen. One of my favorite, uh, two favorite slogans to, to Tim's, not nearly as colorful, but uh, are uh, the imperative uh, to follow a rough and refine, rough and refine, do it quickly and refine it as you go along. The long planning cycles just, you can't, you can't afford a 12 month planning cycle and then you start and then, my God, your, your market's changed under you. Rough and refine and, and fail faster. By all means, I think fear of failure is a real barrier. Just uh, have it built in. But uh, uh, fear, fear of not listening to your customers is a bigger failure. I mean, you've got to be aggressive about moving in this direction. This is where, this is where it's going. You know, you have to have a service layer to your business. You know, because standard media over time is going to become, you know, that'll move more and more to the exchanges and become pro programmatic in terms of how it's bought. We say it in the halls of IDG these days, almost everything is custom already, and it'll increasingly become more that way. What about the hard, let me make sure you don't dodge the hard-nosed margin question. I mean, net, net, and you can say it's, you can say it's a transition, but net, net, now versus five years ago, some of you public companies, maybe you can't answer, I don't know, but are your margins, are your margins holding up or are you taking a margin beating with these new business models? Just, what's, what, what's happening to margins? So without wanting to avoid your question, <laughs> I, think, um, I think a better measure is top line growth. Um, and if your margins are a little bit smaller than they used to be, but your top line's growing and you've got happy customers, you've got a good business. So they're taking a hammering. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. Every every public company, if you look at the if you look at the data, um, there are very few businesses now with. I mean, EMAP actually is an extraordinary business, because in two thousand and seven, EMAP had margins in the mid thirties, net net net, extraordinary business. Um, I think Euro Money is currently the highest margin business in the UK listed arena, twenty seven percent margins. We were twenty six percent margins when we went off went off the market in two thousand and six, early 2007, our margins are now 16%. They've taken a battering. 
Um, now, they've taken our battery because actually we, luckily in the world we're in, we actually can quietly reinvest. We are investing and we are looking to the future and we have spent a great deal of money on, on, on testing in various places. But I, you know, in, in what I was called traditional trade markets, I think it's going to be tough to get back to high 20s. I really do. Um, because the world evolves and will continue to evolve and you've got to, you've got to move with it. Print, print assets were beautiful. You know, the old model of gross margins never being, never being uh, uh, less than 70. You know, it was a wonderful Graham Sharon teaching that you, you were a fool if you had your print and distribution margins um, ahead of, you know, if your cost wasn't less than 30%, because that's the way you made money. But you don't, you don't have that now. You don't have that luxury. I heard someone in the, um, in the uh, virtual events and uh, events session, the breakout, uh, you know, talk about, <coughs> I think the statement was made, the events business has been less affected by digital than the other areas, and then we went on to talk about virtual events, but how's the events building holding, the <coughs> events business holding up the live in-person events? I mean, I haven't seen that take a hit. We talk about these margins on the others. Are you all finding no, the events it's, business it's holding up? It's still, I think, getting like half of all B2B budgets, and, and it's growing for sure, I think, in most categories. I mean, you could still get you know, 65, 70% margins in the exposition side of events. Yes. Conferences less so, but, yes. you know, uh, that's been a huge growth area in our company and many, uh, many uh, B2B companies. I think events came back very quickly after uh, the downturn in 08 and 09, and yeah, I see no end in sight there. Yeah. I mean, I think without events, we'd be struggling, you know, maybe, yeah. because if you look at our model, as you say, you know, we all grew out of print, effectively. Um, but now 30% of our revenue is coming from events. And for us, that's, that's really important. 50% in your case. But that's coming from you know, a relatively low base. And I think it will continue to be you know, a key part of the strategy. has got to be not just pay content, which we're talking about in terms of subs, but that, that other side. And to clarify, I wish it was 50%. If that's the mm. industry, you know, for us, it's much mm. less than 50%. It's, it's, mm. I echo that completely. Our events business is fantastic, and um, there was one year where, you know, in the middle of the recession, where it sort of paused for a moment, yes. but it's been growing uh, beautifully before and beautifully afterwards. Um, and our customers, um, uh, uh, when they value it, when we ask them for their valuations, you know, they just score so incredibly highly. Um, high. So we will we will keep giving them what they want because it's it's serving everybody. I mean, a beautiful thing about events is I mean it is a late cycle impacted business because you normally got great visibility going into the downturn, advertising goes first, events sort of lag because the sponsorship sponsorship should be sold or the exhibition space should be sold forward. So you have, you've got time to react. But I mean again the cost of entry to events, particularly who have relationships in a community, is so low. The risk is so low. I mean, the core, the core for us is around investing in the right quality producers, the right quality people to continue to, to grow the business um, globally. And, and it, it's the largest part of what we do. It's 42%, I think, of what we do. I want to come back to events and global growth in a minute, but I'll just throw in some more data. It certainly mirrors Natasha's. When we ask advertisers in our studies every year to rate the effectiveness for, and we ask it two different ways, the effectiveness for branding and effectiveness for lead generation. We ask separate questions. And again, I'm emphasizing this for the moment and we'll move on, but because the focus is on digital so heavily that I think events sometimes uh, are obscured. But when we ask advertisers to rate the effectiveness, <laughs> number one, the most effective, and we give them 25 choices all the way from their own website to search to webinars to white papers to social media, I mean, a long list. Sky high, off the charts in the top right corner for highest effectiveness are live, in-person events and exhibitions. The only thing close, number three, is their own websites. Effectiveness of their own websites. So don't, don't overlook the role of in-person events in the mix in this, digital, in, in this digital environment. Let me tie it back to global. I know some folks have certainly, uh, I think of uh, Reed Elsevier, Reed Exhibitions, uh, UBM, have uh, been heavy acquirers of events uh, outside of uh, Europe and US. Any of you, I'm, I'm going to move to a global growth question, so if it's events, fine, if it's something else, where are you finding success globally and what types of businesses are you finding it in? Anyone? Um, 
I mean, you know, we're, we're pretty global. Um, you know, we, 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 IDG doesn't really have a, an aggressive acquisition strategy. We mostly launch our own and we share a lot of best practices in our company. And we try to minimize risk by seeing what worked in, uh, in other markets. And there are more similarities than, than, than dissimilarities in, in most markets these days. There used to be a much larger lag in terms of, uh, you know, you launch in the U.S. and then three years later, you know, in, in you know, outside of the U.S. It's, the time the market now is so much uh, collapsed, you know, and I thought it was interesting that Apple is introducing the iPad 3 in 36 countries in just a few months. So the, the lag we're seeing all over the place is, is diminished. Um, so, so, you know, what's, what's working are the things that work in most markets, you know, lead gen, digital events, uh, these are all, you know, at the core of, uh, of our proposition. And, um, you know, again, we're seeing, you know, what works globally implemented locally, and we have local language to all of our properties. That's a key part of what we do. You know, we don't, we don't produce it in Boston and then replicate it throughout the world. We have 38 global editions of PC World. We've got 40-some-odd editions of Computer World, all local language. You have to speak to folks in their local language and make sure you're incorporating local issues. That, that still is uh, of, of paramount importance. And then distribute that in a very modern way through digital, uh, et cetera. Uh, you know, and those are the things that work in general. It's so hard to generalize you know, when you're talking about you know, so many countries, but, but that's, uh, that's a snapshot. Yeah, Tim. Um, I mean, we, we, through acquisition, of course, got ourselves into a bit of trouble with a, a global growth strategy. <laughs> um, but uh, thank, thank, thankfully, we're through that now. Um, but if we take, again, uh, domestic, some of our, our properties are very domestic and their content won't travel because regulation drives that local content. But where we have, um, particularly in uh, Europe, in private equity, a data business and in our risk management, operational risk and compliance business, that is a wonderful uh, academic facing business because the, the content is completely global. Um, uh, anywhere there is an investment bank now, Basel III is a sort of key regulatory driver that, that sort of everyone's <laughs> looking to. So we, um, we do local language uh, stuff. We um, geo-clone, we call it internally, successful events um, from market to market because the content is the same. We might, we might get local speakers to rap. Um, but that's, I have to say, if you look at the sort of growth in our event business, particularly in Asia, it's through our ability to take successful US and European facing content and then mirror it out into that region. We've done it in risk management, we've been very successful in search engine marketing and online marketing with our SES brand. So that business we sort of now have run, I think we have nine or 10 countries that we run the SES show. London was a couple of weeks ago. We do it in local language, we do it in Mandarin. But we, we also gone to mainland China and we've done local private equity facing, FX facing, risk management facing stuff. LATAM, small at the moment for us, very small, but Im important. Um, I think we, there's, there was a bubble in Latin America. You know, you, you talked about the stats of 4.8% growth. It's a bubble, um, but actually um, we, we are um, doing some work there, but running uh, most of our LATAM events out of our North American office, so we don't have local people. Asia, we have an Asian office and it's local. Um, and then of course what we're doing is we're backfilling, when we built an event, we're, we're, we're building local content through our uh, online properties, through having local resource. And lead gen, well, lead gen, we, we, we haven't been as successful in lead gen in North America, it's very competitive. We've got a lot of inventory and when we compete with this man, that man, in the North America in technology, but we've got an enormous amount of inventory that we really don't monetize. Uh, uh, well enough, and there's this convergence between online marketing and tech anyway, which we're trying to take advantage of. Um, but lead gen in Asia is actually beginning to really grow. Um, it's important. Did you say we compete? Sort of. Oh. <laughs> now you piss all over me. That. You piss all over me. That you never noticed. <laughs> our, our panel's wonderful. You learn the most incredible things. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> how about Natasha, Tim? What about the global? What do you uh, think, Jim? By the way, can I just come? What do you think? No. Paul? <laughs> <laughs> Just friendly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, I think we're at the opposite end of the scale at the moment in that we have, we have properties that are global. So Creative Review is a good, good example. You know, 60% of its traffic is outside of the UK, 500,000 Twitter followers, you know, an amazing reach and positioning 
globally. You know, there's no, nothing else like it globally. It's a, you know, monthly for advertising creatives. Um, but to, to get to a kind of revenue model that makes sense from that is really difficult. You can sell some subs on the back of the tweets. We've absolutely done that. But trying to do more than that is difficult. We've tried doing global conferences, but hard in markets where there's not much in the way of sponsorship and they're not prepared to pay high delegate rates. So I think what's interesting is, is you know, where, you've got a, where you're in a global niche and the lawyer would be in a similar global niche in terms mm -hmm. of corporate lawyers, it's this potential, but working out how you really fulfill it, I think, is, is tricky. We, we st I mean, sorry to but mm. we stumbled on, um, again, this similar, similar, not with Twitter followers, but with our British Journal of Photography iPad app. And it's our oldest mag. It's 170 God years old. <laughs> I mean, it, to be fair, and I know mm -hmm. hope, hope there's none in the audience, but it's not our most successful. It's quite small. Um, uh, but we, you know, here's a product that's got monthly uh, sort of seven or 8,000 subscribers, and we've had 135,000 downloads to the app. And the majority of those apps are outside the UK, uh, downloads are outside the UK. So you've got a, you know, a professional photographer's mag that actually does have the ability to, to sort of reach out. And of course, we've monetized it through a sponsored approach to the app. And we have got some subscriptions, small amounts, only in the thousands, not hundreds of thousands, sadly. But we then charge the sponsor um, a, an uplift on the traffic. So they, they, they're paying a bit more to us for um, sort of over-delivery, if that makes sense. Um, EMAP has some really big global brands. Um, sadly, I don't look after any of those, but um, the three that we probably guys would know would be um, Can Lion, so for the creative advertising industry, um, WGSN for the fashion industry, and also Planet Retail. Um, so those two products are digital information businesses with very um, substantial subscription revenues um, and Can Lion is, a, is an event, it's a festival. Um, and EMAP strategy absolutely has a, has a global strategy to grow revenues um, uh, from international revenues and to extend our, our assets overseas. The publishing business, which is the one that I look after, I've got two brands which have a true global reach, Shots, which is again for the creative ad, in, uh, ad industry and also um, Screen International. Oh, I've just thought of my third, looking at my uh, managing director over there, which is Architectural <laughs> Review, so I have three, sorry about that. Um, and, uh, and we take subscribers, we take advertisers. So um, I'm, it's not top of my priority list to go and license and extend the brands into lots of different regions, but absolutely there is international revenue uh, that, that we can go and find. Given just one question on this, and Tim, you touched on it. I mean, you called it a bubble, the, the LATAM growth. But given the assumption that growth rates uh, will be above of emerging markets, including Latin America, China, Asia Pacific, will be above US and Europe, and even perhaps anticipating UK, Europe having a little bit of a rough sled, uh, is that going to change? I mean, will you go? Uh, will you go? more aggressively after those markets or are some of these barriers that you raised just push it down the priority list i mean yeah i think for us where we i mean we just raised 40 million um to make acquisitions now one of the key objectives with those acquisitions is digital information but also to internationalize the business okay. now hopefully <laughs> We'll end up in a different position for the <laughs> But um, I think, you know... I'm very happy with my position, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I still own the house. <laughs> but I think you know, that, that's clearly the priority. I don't think, you know, you, you want businesses that have global potential or are already delivering revenue overseas. So one acquisition we made last year, for instance, was FEM, which is a very niche business. It's the Forum for Expatriate Management. And basically, Forum it's about ser serving the market big global companies who look after expats mm -hmm. and you know and that's that has you know more than 50 percent of its revenue generates outside the uk a lot in the us asia you know it's, it's a very interesting niche business but also ha the other interesting thing about that business is it's an events business that grew from a linkedin group mm -hmm. so it was formed from a linkedin group so yeah. you know that connection you were talking about earlier in terms of events and digital i think we saw in action there very fast growing business and I think a lot we can learn from it. I mean, it's a very niche business, but a, a very interesting one for us in terms of what we can learn. We've got a simple saying in our business, don't be a busy fool. So actually, I think where you get growth, you have 
you frankly have an easier time hopefully launching. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, it's, it's much, it was much harder launching stuff, to be fair, in uh, North America uh, three years ago than it was in uh, the Far East, um, so in China and in Singapore um, or in India. So you know, our focus was to put, you know, at that time, the resources which are scarce that we had on the ground where we thought we'd get the maximum return. Now, of course, you, you can chase the dollar um, or you can chase you know, where you think the value will accrue for the buyer. Ultimately, you know, our job is to just improve the value of the business right. overall. And of course, you have to diversify your mix, but you, we've all got limited resources. And I think those resources need to be pointed where you think you can get the dollar faster. I want to combine two of our topics in the next question. Um, one, uh, I have a strong sense that there was a lot of discussion this morning about the, uh, the, the bleeding or the influence of consumer-focused media and advertising and B2B-focused uh, uh, media and advertising. You know, we, I personally am seeing some cases now where, I mean, I don't have my iPad with me, but if I pulled up uh, TechCrunch and Read, Write, <coughs> Web and uh, Ad Age and whatever, a whole list of media publications, and I scrolled across the carousels, every article would be, in effect, about consumer advertising. So on the one hand, we live in a world where what we so read and hear as professionals focuses on consumer marketing, consumer audiences, consumer advertising, but we're B2B trade publishers. So I'm seeing cases in our studies of advertisers where there's some true divergence, and we actually plot them on a grid, consumer versus B2B, to see where advertisers find effectiveness differences between a, a consumer approach and a B2B approach. So the two-part question here is, and as a lead-in, I have to use one of my favorite quotes. This came from a, I don't want to reveal too much of my checkered past, but I mentioned that I was a physics major. I was also an English major and taught, taught English in school for a while. But uh, in one of the, uh, a class I had on the English novel, I had a professor who uh, advised me that if you go look up the 1954 Paris Review, and you can do it, I, I give you the URL, but it's too long, <laughs> but you can find it. There was a famous interview uh, conducted with Ernest Hemingway, sitting where else but in a bar in Madrid, and uh, 1954, and his, his uh, quote is, the most, is, the most essential gift for a good writer is a built-in, shock-proof shit detector. <laughs> this is the writer's radar, and all great writers have it. So I'm going to combine the question of consumer B2B, following the wrong lead, and ask you, what's, what's the one thing, the, the biggest red herring, the biggest canard, the biggest thing that maybe you, you know, uh, thought you should have emphasized, focused, hired, invested in, but you've drawn back. You've said, you know, it's smarter not to go down that road. I'm not, not uh, you know, again, we're all, in the, we're all in the honest fail faster and, you know, and fuck ups are fine world, so uh, go right ahead. I mean, what, what just, I think it's helpful to hear you know, what people have tried. And I, heard you know, a, that, I heard a wonderful that's saying, not too good. wonderful phrase at the SES conference, um, uh, had a Google uh, guy um, sort of said, hits, how idiots track success. <laughs> now, to me, that is it. I think if we look back at where we all were a few years ago, um, sort of scrambling for hits and eyeballs, we gave away <coughs> our most important asset. And I know you might argue with this, Ben, <laughs> but I believe passionately that in the old-fashioned approach of sending out a controlled circulation magazine or a subscription magazine, we ask them either for a bit of money and a bit of information on themselves, or we ask them to fill in an almighty registration card, which we then use that data very effectively with our buying community. And we gave that all up five, five six years ago. I'm, I'm an, most B2B businesses just opened everything up and they went for flybys, not fans. You know? And that, I think, is a big mistake because for B2B businesses, the most valuable asset you have is the relationship with that buyer, that influencer, that, that one person or a group of people. And so it, it, it certainly was, I think, something that we made a mistake doing, opening up. But we now have, we now have gateways. So I think that was uh, you know, chasing 
chasing the, the sort of hits, in, in, in my view, was a big mistake. So I absolutely agree with that. And, and we had 18 months of silliness too. Um, and you know, very quickly we realized that for the future of the business and also for the customers, and actually what they wanted to get out of it was they didn't want a broad church of individuals. They wanted the very, very specific people that they, uh, the hard to reach specific people. Uh, so for us, that, that was a, a lesson learned and, and you know, progressing nothing very nicely. Since nothing then. points this up to me stronger than the fact that a conversation with a consumer advertiser, there used to be a magic threshold audience. You know, is your audience a million or higher? Gee, I'm not interested if it's not. I mean, what an inane statement with a B2B advertising market. The audience of one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. No, I mean, I have a, there's a company I work with that sells mass spectrometers, you know, to uh, health sciences labs. Well, I mean, how many mass spectrometers, you know, how many people who buy mass spectrometers are there, but they, they cost, you know, six figures. So anyway, I Bob, Tim, do you yeah. have anything? I mean, I, I think that's absolutely true. I think the <clears throat> what we have to be careful of, though, I think, I mean, I think that that's all true. We need to put more gateways in, all of that. But I think particularly for those of us who co come much more from the controlled circulation heritage, so our, you know, our proposition was very much to give total coverage of a market. You've got to be very careful not to put too many barriers in place. So I think you need a much more sophisticated um, approach to collecting data in terms of gateways and things. And I think you know, we're starting to do that. But I think the other thing that we've got to be careful of is, is not to immediately thing, which I think there was a danger of perhaps a year or so ago when there was a big kind of move, everyone moving towards pay content and putting up the gateways, is if you've not got subscription sites, you can face a very big challenge, I think, in trying to turn a, what had been a free product into a paid for product. And I think that's one that, that remains a, a big issue because turning it's... Turning the switch the yeah, other way. Yeah, turning the switch the other way. And I think it's a diverse set of revenue that you've got to look at in those kind of products. I don't believe that you can simply change it from one model to another. I mean, I think with many of, obviously, of your properties, it's actually, you're in a very different position because mm. people are used to paying for it. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, you can put that gateway up and mm. make it very rigorous. Well, that, that I think we, yes. we face a different mix of challenges. Do you want to do a deal? Should we charge I Investment Week and Money Marketing? <laughs> exactly. We'll go together. <laughs> Heard it first, you know. I'll get banged up by the DTI. <laughs> Bob, what would you say about the, the false leads or the false promises? Right, well, I mean, we've, we've been spending time in the last two years putting up registration walls where we can and doing the trade-off with traffic versus you know, getting users to, to, to give us more information about themselves. I, I do think though there's, um, there's another, I, I don't want to exaggerate and say it's a renaissance in the whole data space, but I do think there'll be, there, there are new opportunities now to leverage the data you have uh, to be able to do uh, things more expansively on the broader web uh, we have a lot of advertisers that are coming to us and they have their own data management platforms and they're saying, what can we do together in terms of you know, our, first, our data, your data, other third-party data? How do we find these users in other places? How do we optimize our experience on our websites, you know, leveraging all this data? Um, <clears throat> how do we Im improve engagement? So I think, and, and, and you know, as B2B companies, we hold the keys to that kingdom to a large degree because you know, we, we have permission within our environment to be able to, um, to use that data, or varying levels of permission and varying degrees in different countries, uh, but being able to leverage that to help answer some of those questions. And, and I think that's going to be a big shift, and I think it's actually a huge opportunity for B2B companies in particular. Uh, you know, it's very fashionable now to talk about data strategies, et cetera, but this is a real thing that's happening, and the market is really bifurcating to sort of premium, uh, more higher touch, with, at least with regard to online sales, with a lot of marketing services to program, exchange, RTB, and this sort of thing. But I think that somewhere in the middle, there's an opportunity for publishers that have a lot of data to be able to develop strategies in partnership with marketers to be able to not just retarget, but to help create a more end-to-end -end experience between our website and the event and the advertiser's websites be able to improve the engagement overall, to be able to tell how many people came back to those pages, to be able to optimize those pages for maximum engagement. And you know, this is a whole topic in and of itself. But so when I think about data, I think about, okay, yeah, getting our audiences to give us more information, but then how do we use that in more expansive ways in high opportunity categories you know, where we have permissions to do so? And I think 
I think here in the, um, in the UK and the EU, you have a much different problem than I'm used to in the US. But I think one of the biggest opportunities for trade publishers is to reinforce what I call the, the gentleman's handshake. I mean, the essence of B2B trade publishing that properly targeted information is hugely valuable and every professional wants it. It's not a matter, so I wrote a piece last year because of the do not track talk in the US it, and the headline was do not track, do not track me, just spam me with irrelevant junk. I mean, do you want somebody to send you what's relevant to you based on data about you or just everything because no one is allowed to know anything about you? I mean, that's an obligation of media companies to make sure that comes loud and true. And it's not that hard a fight because the audience, I think, is willing to buy into that. But just because of time pressures and the fact that we did want to offer a chance for questions, uh, I'm ready for, for Q&A if anybody has any questions.